Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mayan Krivashe and I work at Gutman Library. Uh, welcome to the third book talk of the academic year, From Oops to Aha, Portraits of Learning from Mistakes in Kindergarten. Written by Malika Donaldson, an alumna of the Harvard Graduate School of Education. It's nice to have you back, Malika. I would like to begin by introducing Dr. Tina Goetzer, senior researcher at Project Zero and faculty member at HGSC, who will introduce Dr. Donaldson shortly. I would also like to encourage all of you to put your questions into the Q&A feature and let you know that chat is only enabled for us to communicate with the audience. Tina, you can take it from here. Great. It gives me immense pleasure to welcome Professor Malika Donaldson back to the Harvard Graduate School of Education and to introduce her to all of you. To many of you, she needs no introduction because her roots at the Ed School run deep, but her accomplishments here and upon leaving the Ed School rise high. I met Malika in the fall of 2010 when she was a master's student at, at HGSC. What was immediately apparent was her dedication to children and her deep and insightful manner of observing and interacting with learners. In the intervening decade, Malika has become an accomplished academic. She is currently an assistant professor of education and child study at Smith College, Prior to this, she was on the faculty at the University of Hartford, working with pre-service teachers in early childhood and elementary programs. In addition to being a college professor, Malika is a published author, educational researcher, and former classroom teacher. She has worked in the field of education since 2005, first as an early childhood teacher and later as a tutor, curriculum designer, and science education specialist. In 2017, she graduated from HGSC with her doctorate, but also with two master's degree and her AB from Harvard. In her time here, she contributed to the work in many labs, including my own, the Click Lab at Project Zero, as well as the Reads Lab. She was a fellow at the Center for the De on the Developing Child, was a tutor in the HGSC Writing Center, and an advisor in residential life for Harvard College. She has won many fellowships and awards from a variety of organizations, including the American Educational Research Association, the National Association for Research and Science Teaching, and Phi Delta Kappa. She regularly presents her work at referee conferences, and her written work appears in peer-reviewed journals, including the Harvard Educational Review and the Journal of Educational Research. And of course, the reason that we're gathered here today is that she's written her first book. More on that in a moment. Um, all of these accomplishments took place while she was busy with the one that I consider to be one of her most important, being an amazing mom to her intelligent, creative, and beautiful daughter, Naomi. The book that she will share with you stems from her dissertation work focused on the daily experiences of, of kindergarten teachers, utilizing the research methods of interviewing and portraiture to explore how teachers respond to young children's mistakes during instruction. From Oops to Aha is a result of years of intensive observations and careful analysis, examining instruction in the classrooms of four public school kindergarten teachers. In the book, Malika juxtaposes the wide range of micro level interactions, um, child teacher interactions that occur when young students make mistakes while illuminating how factors beyond the teachers control, shape their approaches to teaching and learning and contribute to structural inequities. We are looking forward to hearing about the book in her words. So without further delay, let's give a very warm welcome to Dr. Malika Donaldson. Thank you so much, Tina for that wonderful welcome and sincere thanks to the Gutman Library and to my aunt for hosting this event. It's my pleasure to share this with you today. And what I will do to give a brief overview is give a little bit of background as to why am I focusing on kindergarten, why, why the stakes, the methodology that I use to do this study and what I see as implications for the future before I open it up for questions and answers. And what, the format that I'll take is I will give some snapshots uh, from the four teachers who are featured in the book 
and read some excerpts so that you can get a sense of what the book is like, what the life was like in that classroom. I really do encourage you to please put any questions that you might have in the chat as you think of them, and then we'll have time for that toward the end of the talk. So this book is based on a study in which my key question is, looking closely at kindergarten teachers in context, what is the nature of daily teacher-student interactions regarding mistakes? And so I was so honored to four kindergarten teachers who welcomed me into their classrooms for extended periods of time to observe them, to learn from them and from their students, and to really delve into the nature of micro level interactions in early childhood kindergarten classrooms. So to get started, first, the first snapshot is uh, from chapter one of Mr. Allen. Uh, and he taught in an urban district. He had 23 students in his classroom the year that I was with him. Nine years of teaching experience. He was right in the center of a major urban area and he served predominantly students of color and lower income uh, families. So let me read an excerpt from his chapter to give you a sense of what life was like in his classroom. Hold on a second. <laughs> One morning during their meeting, Mr. Allen is talking to the students in the whole group about sight words, offering about read and see in class. So I've been noticing in your writing, in writer's workshop, there are some words that you guys are often trying to write quite a lot. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I wrote those words down, I put a magnet on the back, and I'm going to put them up on the word wall over where our names are. Looking up at the word wall, I can see a similarly fashioned magnet with each student's name listed under a large printout that corresponds with the first letter of each name. So if you're thinking, ooh, how do I spell that word? What can you do? Look up there, several children say, pointing up to the wall. Mr. Allen mirrors them, reaching his arm up, holding it out toward the word wall. Look at it right there, and it will be there. Mr. Allen finds his first card and holds it flat against his chest, hiding the front side from the view of the students. Who thinks, if you can raise your hand, who knows what word this is? He flips the card around and shows it to the class. I, the children call out in chorus. Mr. Allen turns the card around back to his chest, then holds it up again. Oh, do not call out. He turns his attention to one student. What do you see? He lets the student read the letter. Even as others are calling out, he does not acknowledge their answers and maintains focus just on the student he called. I, Mr. Allen exclaims, do you know you just read a word? I is a letter that's a word. They continue on with another easy peasy word, A. After the class guesses the word correctly, he gives a couple of students a chance to try it out in a sentence. I saw a train. I was a dog. He moves on by drawing another card and after a quick glance, pushes it against his chest to hide it as well. This is probably the word I see kids trying to write the most. He shakes his head left and right as he issues a plea. Please don't call out. Please don't call out. When he flips over the card, there is absolute silence in the room. After a few seconds, one of the children breaks the silence. Wars, he says, lingering a bit on the R sound. Ooh, close. After a second, he notices a raised hand and he says, Lily, what do you think? Do you have an idea? Yeah. Rather than requesting that someone give him a right answer, he offers Lily a chance to take a guess. When he calls on her, her raised hand drops to the corner of her mouth. She stares at the card. Out of the silence, one student starts to repeatedly call out guesses. In response, Mr. Allen shakes his head left and right. While looking straight at the kid calling out, he says to the class, if you're calling out, you will not get a turn to try. He turns his attention back to, to Lily. What do you think it is? 10 seconds of think time have passed since she was called. Lily looks up at him and admits, I don't know. That's okay, he assures her. He turns to other hands that have been raised. What do you think, Noelle? Noelle drops her hand and tries out the word. Worse, she utters softly, looking up at Mr. Allen. Close, it starts with that sound. Scott, 
Like Noel, Scott says his guest fast. It is quick and quiet. Was? It looks like it should be was, doesn't it? And that's why I'm showing you this word. Mr. Allen pauses. To this point, he has gotten four different student responses. Wars, worse, was, and I don't know. With each child as, child's attempt, he has affirmed the response given and reassured that it's okay not to know it. The word isn't was, it's was. He repeats, was. Some of the children call out, that's what I was going to say. Good, kiss your brain, he replies, affirming their self-proclaimed correctness. If I was going to write it how it sounded, I would write W-U-Z, but some words are not written the way that they should be. So if you're trying to write, I was, just look at the word wall. They'll be up there. Even though all of the guesses are wrong, Mr. Allen holds out for a long while before telling students the correct pronunciation for the sight word, allowing them to really think for themselves and sit with it. Collecting many answers from around the room is a form of student inquiry during his instruction that allows different students to engage in the process and expresses that he is flexible and open to accepting a wide range of ideas from them. In this case, they are just learning this new word and they do not come up with the answer for themselves. Later on, when they again go through all of the cards to practice, they still miss it. When this happens, Mr. Allen simply raises his right hand to his cheek, making the class's hand signal for the sound of W, was. It doesn't make sense, he says, shrugging his shoulders. So I'm glad to share a little bit, a little snapshot from Mr. Allen's classroom. And I wanna take a moment before going on to just think and share a little bit about why do I focus on kindergarten and why mistakes? So it really goes back to my own experiences as a teacher that has really inspired my work on this uh, because I had the experience of teaching in two very, very different types of kindergarten classrooms. and it really taught me that where we are, where we're teaching, the space, the context really matter. So I had the opportunity to teach in Northwest DC in, um, and work with a 100% African-American population. And unfortunately it didn't have the resources that I needed, even just things, simple things like copy paper and crayons and markers and a copier that works. And my, my aide who was supposed to support me, I was always struggling to have what I needed to do uh, my teaching and also had a very large class. Then a couple of years later, I moved across the country to Los Angeles and I was working in Los Angeles at a school that had a very small class size, very well resourced. And this was really impactful for me to have these two, I was the same person I had a little bit more experience by the time I was in Los Angeles, of course, but I was able to do so much more when I had the resources that I needed, when I had the support that I needed, um, despite having the same passion for the grade level, um, it, it was just remarkable to me. And that really has inspired this work. Also, I learned in those classrooms that who we are really, really matters when it comes to how we respond to mistakes and how we learn in general. And I did find that um, in one particular instance, I, I had two children in the same classroom where I was giving the same messages specifically about making mistakes and taking risks, which I was encouraging. And, and one of them leaned into it. She trusted me. She tried. And the other one just was so nervous to make mistakes. It held her back in her learning and to the point that she wouldn't even complete work. This was absolutely just fascinating to me. I felt like I was being consistent, but yet the individual children were having such different responses to mistakes. So when I arrived at HGSE years ago, um, I had the great opportunity to really learn so much about the science of learning, how we learn, um, the embodied experience, the cognitive experience, all these things. And I also got to learn portraiture from Sarah Lawrence Lightfoot, which, which was just amazing. And I had this wonderful opportunity to take a step back from my busy classroom with the kindergartners and hustle and bustle and reflect on my past teaching and also being in an environment where I could just dive into research on feedback. Um, there's, there's so much work on this and just really learn what we already know about it. My interest started with 
praise and communications with the students, interactions with the students, and then over time morphed into this curiosity about mistakes and feedback and really the context and how people, how the teachers and students interact with each other. So really context in my view, from what I've learned from prior research, from my own research is that that really shapes development and learning. This is a foundational principle. And that includes for mistake responses. Now, there's also a great deal of work that is looking at teacher responses to mistakes, which is kind of a, the corner of the world that I am focused in on in this book, and that that does vary by country. So there's a great deal of work in Europe that focuses specifically on teacher responses to mistakes. And there's also work that shows that these teachers' responses do vary by country. Now, when compared to other countries, often the U.S. tends to mitigate their feedback or mitigate uh, the children's mistakes to kind of soften the blow for them. But as I read this research, I learned so much from it. But I did ask myself, are there within country variations, though? And what does this look like in real world practice? So I want to take us to another chapter um, to share with you Miss Rivers. And she worked in a no excuses charter school. She had 15 students in her class, eight years of teaching experience at the time I came into her room and was in an urban community, just like Mr. Allen, a similar area. She taught 100% students of color and there was a very high immigrant population. So I will read, oh, so there's, and so why observe mistakes in this particular context? No excuses charter schools have an explicit mission to close the achievement gap across race, across class, and at strong academic performance is a goal, even from kindergarten. High academic standards are the norm for all students, and as the name says, there is no excuse not to meet those standards. That is the mentality in the school, and there's this very targeted focus on preparing for college. This is a really popular option that families um, do pursue within urban settings. And so, and it has a really distinctive instructional style that is um, different from others. So I'm going to read an excerpt from um, a couple of short excerpts from her chapter. The mistake culture in Miss Rivers' classroom is most certainly shaped by the achievement culture of the broader school environment. Compared to the chronically low academic performance in uh, nearby public district schools, best charter students excel. High standardized test scores are a point of pride for the school as best charter scholars, a common term used to reference the children at the school, rank among the best in the state on several sections of the proficiency exams. Work towards strong and measurable outcomes begins on the first day of kindergarten and Ms. River shares that at the close of the academic year, the entire class is at or above expectations on the best charter school networks grade level tests. Ms. Rivers' team knows that, oh, hold on. Yeah. Ms. Rivers' team knows that trying hard means listening, staying engaged, and preparing to provide correct responses quickly, whenever prompted. In her words, actions, and tone of voice, Ms. Rivers conveys that it is unacceptable to remain silent when asked to generate a response. Disengaging or being passive are huge mistakes in her classroom. One day she has a private conversation with men after the other children are dismissed to their tables to start some seat work. I overhear her in a whispered hush as she sharply scolds him for keeping his hand down during the prior lesson. Through her subsequent comments, she appears to interpret his lack of engagement as withdrawal from the learning experience. When I ask you to talk, you have to talk. You have a responsibility to the team to teach them what you know. It's not okay to pretend that you don't understand. I know that you do understand. It's not okay that you're pretending that you don't. Or if you do feel confused, you need to listen well instead of playing with your fingers. So we're gonna practice listening and talking now. In my interpretation, this feedback indicates that silence and inaction are unacceptable. In her remarks, Ms. Rivers conveys confidence in men's ability to complete the task and, clarify, and clarifies that listening and talking are the only acceptable ways to participate, not silence. In a different instance, Ms. Rivers asks Marisol to explain her rationale for her correct answer to a question during math practice. Rather than delve into fine-grained details of how she solved the problem, 
Marisol says various iterations of, I know because I use my brain. It doesn't land well with Ms. Rivers at the onset. As Marisol says it two additional times, interspersed with a number of unclear and or incorrect explanations, Ms. Rivers eventually loses patience with this answer, cuts her off, and sternly redirects her. Marisol, stop saying you used your brain. You have to talk about the numbers. You used all these strategies yesterday. You were here yesterday. You were part of this conversation. She points at large pieces of white paper with drawings and notes that reflect the ideas developed by the children during the math lesson the prior day. You can use Nikki's strategy and count. You can use Elizabeth's strategy and use the number line. As Ms. Rivers talks to Marisol, the other children are absolutely silent, seated on their spots, tracking the conversation throughout. You have to talk about a tool or a strategy that you are using. You can't just say, raising your arms and saying in a high-pitched voice, I just know, I know when to snap. Ms. Rivers drops her shoulders and shakes her head no as she looks at Marisol. You can't say that. You have to talk about something. Ms. Rivers reaches out her hand toward Marisol, inviting another try. How do you know? Although she constantly talks about how the team must use their brains to solve challenging problems, this phrase alone is not an adequate explanation without further detail to back it up. Ms. Rivers' comment clearly indicates that this is an unacceptable response, and she insists that Marisol must provide a detailed, content-based explanation to justify her answer. Often, I see Ms. Rivers prompt this from children mid-discussion by asking them to finish the phrase, I know because, offering an additional opportunity to try to explain their thinking. They are expected to fill in the blanks. After this particular instance, Ms. Rivers continues to ask Marisol questions for more than two minutes, pushing her to select one of the strategies developed by the class in a prior lesson and to use it as the basis of a verbal rationale that explains her answer. I am amazed at the resilience that Marisol shows throughout the exchange as she received very direct feedback about the imprecision of her language and is asked again and again to self-correct her errors. I think children typically would be upset or in tears by now, and even many adults would not take this intense dissection of their mistakes very well. But Marisol does stick with the task at hand and with substantial prompting, eventually crafts a cohesive response. At which point Ms. Rivers instantly declares, you're a star Marisol, that was amazing. Shooting stars for Marisol, one, two, three. Just as teammates and coaches cheer their personal triumphs and victories, the teacher and all of the other children clap and make a sound as their fingers rain down emulating fireworks as a means for them to briefly celebrate Marisol's success before immediately moving on to the next thing on the agenda. So that's a snapshot of, of, um, of Miss, Miss Rivers. And I actually wanna take a moment to just invite you to pause and think about this and think, what do you, wonder what's on your mind about these classrooms so far. So I'm going to actually just be quiet for a moment and allow you about 30 seconds to think. And I really would love it if you would put any of your questions or reflections into the Q&A. All right, thank you. So I wanna spend some time just sharing a little bit about the method that I use for the book. So these are portraits of daily life in real world classrooms. And I use the methodology of portraiture, as I mentioned, um, developed by Sarah Lawrence Lightfoot at HDSE. And so, you know, I like these images because they really do convey uh, a sense of what you're doing with this method. It is anchored in uh, rigorous data collection and analysis and really looking closely at what is happening in the world. So it's a phenomenological approach, uh, but it is through the lens of the portraitist. 
And so I like the picture in the lower left because it shows one individual who had portraits done by two different artists. And so we can tell it's the same person, but it is through that lens. So I can't deny that as a researcher with any method that I'm using, I am, I am going through my own lens of the world. Um, and so that is allowed to be a part of the portrait. And I'm actually in the portraits as far as my voice, my presence is allowed to be there. Um, one thing uh, that I want to say is that this, this, this was a definitely a labor of love, something that I'm really passionate about. And it took so much effort to pull this all together. Um, one thing that really comes across using the method of portraiture is this balance. And it's something that drew me to the method between empiricism and aesthetics. So empiricism meaning that, you know, every single word, every, um, when I talk about people's facial expressions, all of that, that is anchored in data collection. So I was in the schools with each teacher between 40 and 60 hours, um, watching instruction, recording instruction, and then taking field notes, uh, and then going back later and spending many, spending hundreds of hours reviewing all the instances where I noted mistakes or mistake related things or activities of interest within the field notes to make um, elaborated transcriptions. And so taking that, I then went over that and did iterative data review and analysis to come up with themes using grounded theory and kind of use those themes to then figure out what is the story of this teacher to try to answer that research question what is the nature of daily teacher-student interactions regarding mistakes? This was very, very effortful. Uh, but at the same time, I was paying, I needed to, when I get to the point of actually rendering this into the book that is available now, how am I going to make this also be beautiful, also be something that draws in readers that is approachable, that people can feel like they're there. And so having an attention to both of these things, both rigorous data collection, careful analysis, iterative data review, using interviews and observations and um, che constant check-ins with the teachers, photographs of artifacts, all of those things, but to create something that is um, what you have in front of you today. So I wanna share another teacher with you. This is chapter three, Miss Carrie, and she's a public Montessori school teacher. She has 24 kids in her classroom, and there are eight children in three different levels. So it's a children's house classroom, a mixed age classroom. There are eight three to four year olds, there are eight four to five year olds, and there are eight <laughs> five to six year olds, which is the kindergarten level. The teacher had 14 years of experience uh, when I was coming to visit her class, and she was near the same urban center as the prior teachers but in a small city that's adjacent to it. And she served in, in her school population, 60% uh, students of color. So it's people from all around the world, a very diverse student body. Now this Montessori is a very interesting context. Um, some people are very familiar with it. Some people don't know quite what, what it is. Uh, I'll, you'll get a little sense of it in the excerpt that I share. It's, a, it's also like the No Excuses Charter School, very distinctive educational philosophy. It's child-centered. There's this focus on fostering autonomy of the child, but there are very um, carefully prepared materials that are used in a certain way. And so children are taught how to do that. There are multi-age groupings, as I mentioned before. So there's this um, flow of younger children being taught by older children and people partnering together. There's this idea in Montessori of freedom within limits. So children can work independently. They can't do anything they want, but they can um, work at their own pace, select the order of work that they do in many cases. And this idea of control of error, that the answers are actually often built within the items themselves that they are working with and the materials that they're using. So let me read a short excerpt from uh, Ms. Carey. Work time in Carrie Smith's Montessori classroom is always characterized by a flurry of child-driven activity. For many hours a day, young children work in every nook and cranny of Miss Carrie's large classroom, engrossed in a myriad of self-directed activities. Some sit on the floor, 
hunched over small mats while working with neatly arranged materials. Some stand at easels painting, mixing colors and creating works of art. Some wash tables, scoop small beads or eat snacks. Still others sit at child-sized tables, writing or drawing, arranging cards or objects, or talking with a peer about a project. Adding to the movement and energy is the presence of constant sound. The background noise is comprised of an eclectic mix of sources, chairs bumping and scraping when pulled in and pushed out from tables, shoes shuffling across the floor, objects tapping across hard surfaces, instrumental music playing softly, and children's voices. The clamor in the room hums along all morning, not so loud as to be distracting, but too loud to ignore. Day after day, I observe that the main thrust of exertion in room 132, Ms. Carey's classroom, comes from the children themselves. The children make decisions about where to work, who to work with, and what to do next, using teacher-provided instructional materials to make choices and assess their own progress as they go along. As the children buzz about on their own, Ms. Carey is also hard at work in their midst. Whether teaching a child how to do a new activity, marveling at a student's hard-earned moment of success, or providing feedback on how to improve an independently generated work product, Ms. Carey assumes a supportive role for the children as they pursue their personal pathways to learning. She rarely draws the students together into whole or small groups to complete teacher-selected tasks, as is common in more traditional classrooms, Instead, Ms. Carey constantly steps around the room to sit and work in different locations, rapidly shifting her attention from one person to the next throughout the children's daily work time. In these interactions, I witness that she and her students confront many mistakes and misunderstandings. When it comes to more academic activities, Montessori works have the answers built right in so that after completing a task, Children can, can uh, check mistakes for themselves. Cards used to sort letter sounds or rhyming words note the right groupings on the back side so that children can easily flip the cards over after sorting them to see whether they arrange them properly. Children often use the movable alphabet, a set of letter cards or wooden shapes that allow students to spell words and build sentences without, uh, without producing written print. Some works provide a tiny book with correct spellings uh, for checking their answers after they've tried to sound out words for their own, on their own. When children are working on this and they express uncertainty and turn to her for answers, Ms. Carey expresses confidence that they can complete the task. She then turns it back to the child, pushing for independent problem solving by saying something like, you decide what you think is best without telling them exactly what to do or which direction to go. When the children come to her with a question or something they find confusing, she usually provides hints or redirection, but promptly turns the control of the learning experience back over to the students as soon as they are all clear on directions and next steps. I hear this on several occasions at the end of clarifying check-ins with students. I think you're ready to do this on your own, okay? I think you've got the hang of it. You think so? If you need help, just come get me. Notably, in many instances like this, Ms. Carey physically exits the interaction by standing and moving away from the workspace, leaving the child to continue to wrestle with the challenge independently. Ms. Carey wants children to control the pace and the steps in the learning experience, so she often defers to their thinking, even while guiding them with subtle or not so subtle hints. If she intervenes too much um, at these times when they don't know exactly what to do, she would disrupt their learning. I'm gonna pause there. Uh, so you have a little sense of what it's like in Miss uh, in Miss Carey's classroom. Let's see. Make sure I get back to the right page. So next, I want to kind of think about what are some of the implications for the future. So maybe as you're listening, some of this feels familiar like things that you've heard or seen in your own experiences, um, but maybe not. Maybe this is opening your eyes to something that's that's new or fresh. I really do think that this book, with its close-up look at micro-level interactions, does offer a rare view inside of the world of early childhood teaching. And so I, I really do have uh, hopes. Oh, my... 
I really do have some hopes for how this be, can be useful in the future. So for teachers, for practitioners, I want, I hope that people can uh, learn about contexts that are different from their own. Sorry about this. That they can gain some self-awareness of interactions that occur in those spaces um, between themselves and their, and their students and kind of assess whether they like how that is or if there are changes they might like to try out. And also, I think there are some school level and community level conversations that can be had to encourage um, uh, adaptive instructional moves as it relates to mistakes. Researchers have an opportunity to see, um, in addition to the existing research that's in more controlled environments and that's in lab studies, to be able to see what, how this plays out in real world practice and also to make space for teacher voice to be a powerful uh, aspect of, of the discussion on learning from mistakes. I also hope that policymakers can see how, um, this may not have come out in some of the excerpts today, but the specific benchmarks and the myriad as uh, assessments that teachers often have to give can potentially impact um, learning from mistakes in a way that that decreases um, their willingness to do those, to make mistakes. And also juxtaposing these four cases, you really see how differential access to resources impacts day-to-day -day learning and responses to mistakes. And for parents and guardians of children of all ages, actually, not just in early childhood, I think a book like this really can give a sense of what life is like in a classroom. What are the day-to-day -day experiences? What kind of activities and interactions happen in kindergarten? Uh, and what is the work of teaching? What do teachers do? I think this information can help people make more informed school choices and just know what is it that people do in uh, a, a school when they may not have experience with that before. And hopefully also will empower families to advocate for more resources that will improve the conditions of their children's schools. For my last excerpt, I want to read a portion from Mrs. Tucker's uh, chapter, and she taught in a suburban district, 25 years of teaching experience at the time of the study, 19 of those spent in the classroom that I was observing, and she had a, just a ton of resources in her classroom, physical resources, volunteers, um, aides coming in to support, uh, and also had relative autonomy with how she taught, ran her class. In the class of, she had a class of 20 children. The school served mostly white students, and there were a few that were lower SES students in that community. And there were, that particular year, she had numerous IEPs and students receiving services and also being identified. So I'll read one sentence from Mrs. Tucker, or sorry, one portion from Mrs. Tucker. While Mrs. Tucker, in some cases, helps students strive for more reasonable standards, she sometimes urges them, oh, hold on, am I reading? Oh, I'm sorry, I'm reading the wrong section. On more than one occasion in Mrs. Tucker's classroom, I watched her feature several children's mistakes prominently before the audience of the full class. Mrs. Tucker conjures that same sense of amazement as I watch her call attention to student mistakes, drawing all of the children's eyes from around the room squarely onto their peers' fantastic oops. She always frames it as an opportunity and an honor, guiding them along the way as they play out their mistakes for a minute or two in front of the class. I observe one such solo performance on a morning when Mrs. Tucker is updating the schedule to reflect the day's upcoming activities. She asks for a little help from Lionel, who has been working on his letter sound matches. Mrs. Tucker gives him a chance to practice these skills by asking him to replace the card representing the day of the week. Lionel, tell yourself, I need Monday. Mm. Mrs. Tucker hands Lionel a stack of white cards. Mm, Monday. While Lionel sifts through the cards, Mrs. Tucker chats with the class about the specials for the day. Then suddenly Lionel holds up a card toward Mrs. Tucker. His selection has the word Wednesday printed on it in black hand printed letters. Ooh, nice try, she says, pointing at him with an eyebrow raised and a slight smile on her face. That would be an upside down M. Lionel shifts the cards around quickly, placing the Monday card on top, then offers up the stack toward Mrs. Tucker. Yes, yes, she says to him, trust yourself, fantastic. She reaches out and takes the cards from Lionel's small hands. 
Then she addresses the full class. Can I show you this really great oops Lionel just had? Totally understand this oops. She adds, sympathetically shaking her head and looking over at him. Check it out. She holds the Wednesday card in her right hand and the Monday card in her left hand, and both cards face the students. Before them, they see the words Monday and Wednesday. Think silently in her head for a second. Why was this a great oops? The room pauses for a few seconds of silence. Then a student calls out, cause, cause he saw it upside down. Mrs. Tucker makes a surprise gasp. <gasps> Wait a second, she replies. That looks a lot like an M. And especially if you go like, she turns the Monday card upside down and places it right next to the W on the Wednesday card. From my view, the letter shapes look just the same. So Lionel, fantastic oops, nice job. In this moment, Mrs. Tucker gives Lionel a chance to try out something in front of the class. When he makes the fantastic oops, he first lets him know that he made a mistake and gives him the space to correct it. Then after the entire process of trying, making a mistake and self-correcting has taken place, Mrs. Tucker does a slow-mo replay of what happened in front of everyone. This includes first allowing him the chance to self-correct once he is aware of his mistake. Then she talks about it at length, giving a sense of why this is a reasonable mistake. That is, M and W do make the same shape. They are mirror images of each other and therefore easy to mix up. Through this play-by-play -play recap, she offers an opportunity for Lionel to think through his thought process and serve and to serve as a reminder for other students who might be likely to make similar mistakes in the future. With that, um, I'd like to offer a chance to receive some questions and, and just talk a little bit more with you. So thank you. So we have a couple of comments, uh, not questions. Uh, one from Clara Lau saying that she's uh, thrilled to see this work and she um, just wanted to say hi, welcome back to uh, GSC. And we have a comment um, from Alice who said, both styles of teaching seem effective, although clearly Miss Rivers' expectations are aided by the culture of perfection at her school. Um, anyone else has any other questions? You can feel free to put them into the Q&A. I see a raised hand. Oh, okay. Ah, oh, there we go. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. So another comment. Um, what a great presentation. So inspiring and groundbreaking. And we have a question um, from Pasha. I love the really great oops, fantastic oops. Oops slash fantastic oops. Thinking that's where you got the title for your book. Was that an aha for you as well as for the kids? It definitely was because being in Ms. Tucker's classroom, I had never seen a teacher actively cheer mistakes to the point of even she, she had a cube system where they could earn rewards for their class. Sometimes like the, the mistake that I just read there at the end with the M and W, she would say, this was such a great oops. We learned from this, go get a cube and put it into our reward, our reward bin. So there was, it was just turning everything on its head to say, wow, like a mistake can be cheered and to just, you know, it didn't mean that there weren't kids in that classroom that wanted to get everything right. There was of course the whole range of all the different types of responses people can have. But just to think this is this is flexible. Uh, this doesn't have to always be the same way in every classroom. We don't have to have, we don't have the same orientation toward this in every community. So yes, I had lots of ahas in, in the moment um, as I was working on this book. Great, thank you. Uh, we have a follow-up question from Alice. Uh, do you want to talk more about your reactions to Montessori corrections or not corrections? 
Sure. So what what was interesting in the Montessori classroom was that the teacher, Miss Carrie, was spending all of her time basically circulating around the room, talking to one child or two children at a time, usually not more than that. And so the the children, they had, there was a culture there. So again, because you have um, you know, two of the classes at the, on the first day of school, two thirds of the students have already been in that classroom. And so they already get this culture of like, you have to work on your own. You're going to check your own work, all of that. And they can kind of teach the younger children how to do that. But even within that, there was still an expectation that although you work on it on your own, you still do check in with the teacher. So the teacher did want things to be done correctly. She didn't want, there's a section, I didn't read it today, where they are not allowed to look, they can't peek, because sometimes the work that they have has a little book that has the answers, or the card is on the back of the card is the answer. And so there was this trust that had to be built between the children and the teachers that one, you're going to be given the time that you need to work on this, to learn from it. You shouldn't be rushing to try to get to a right answer, um, but also that you're not going to cheat. You're going to, which of course people push, you know, push the boundaries of that. Uh, so I, I thought it was really interesting. Something that I noted was that although the way that the Montessori teacher uh, approached mistakes was was radically different from the no excuses charter school they both were the places that valued corrections the most and valued things being right the most as compared to the two um, the other two teachers so I hope that speaks to what you're asking Alice feel free to um, ask a follow-up question if you'd like thank you I have a question from Catherine so hi Catherine uh, which of those kindergartens um, would you have wanted Naomi to attend? This is a great question. Um, I really think that all of the classrooms, if you have a chance to read it at some point, I try to highlight that there are strengths in all of these spaces. There are, and that's why portraiture is such a wonderful methodology to use for something like this, to look at mistakes. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. I am going to call out things as I see them, but I'm not looking to poke holes in what someone does. I do want to lift up the teachers and honor what they're doing. So I say all of that to say, I respect these people who shared th these many hours of their lives that allow me to tell their story. And I want to be respectful of that. I want to honor that they are doing good work. They're doing the best work that they can in the context that they are in. I think, um, I really like the Montessori philosophy, especially for early childhood. And I think that is a really nice space to be in. It has its um, affordances and it has its drawbacks like any other community, but I like that one a lot. But I, I, think, I think the teachers, um, I really do respect all of them and appreciate their participation. Thank you. Um, I have a question from Megan. Uh, what a fantastic presentation of incredible work. Could you share more about your approach for offering critiques of what you observed based on your own expertise and experience, particularly in the no excuses charter school setting and the extent to which you shared these perspective with uh, your participants? This is a great question. It kind of has a couple of points in it. So I'll see if I can um, you know, address these. So first of all, this idea of my own critiques, that's something that I built into my data collection process. So as I'm in the field, uh, I'm constantly taking field notes, of course, but also memoing. And so if I'm in the field and, I'm, and I'm ex I can tell that I am interpreting something through my own lens, but even within my field notes, I would bracket and put questions or put comments to myself about my own positionality to just remind myself to follow up. Um, so I would often, uh, at the end of the, well, at the end of the day, go home, write a memo up of the key themes that are emerging, and also make sure to note questions that I have, things where I feel like, oh, this is reminding me of something from my own experience, or I can feel myself interpreting. And then I took care to follow up with those teachers throughout the process to check in and say, is this what you thought? And I would several times, many times they'd say, oh no, that's not what I meant. Or 
oh, I hadn't thought about it that way. So it was good that that was built into the process, this constant um, coming up with questions, going back to my, my participants, asking them what they think, triangulating with other instances, other moments in the classroom. So uh, Megan also asked about the extent to which I shared these perspectives, my own perspectives with the participants. I tried not to share too much while I was in the midst of data collection, um, but I did have a final exit interview with them where I asked them a lot of questions and then afterwards kind of had a debrief and shared some of my perspectives. And I did share the portraits with teachers as well. So they could look at it and, and kind of see themselves reflected in it, hopefully fairly. Uh, the no excuses charter school setting is, is a setting that is maybe, it was, it was challenging because there were a lot of questions that I had and I, but I, I really did lead with, I'm curious. I want to understand how this works. I want to be respectful of, of these professionals who are doing this work. And so I tried to lead with that and represent them as fairly as I can while also asking questions about the approaches that are being done there. Thank you. I think we have time for a couple more questions. Um, here's one. Do you think teacher training programs do enough to train future teachers to embrace or even think about mistakes? I think that's a great question. I, I've been working with in teacher education for several years at this point, and I, I don't think, I think that there's so much that, that um, you know, pre-service teachers have to learn and have to do to be prepared that there isn't always enough time to reflect and there may not be enough time to reflect on mistakes uh, for themselves as learners, let alone for their students. I found um, in an interview study that I did that uh, with kindergarten teachers, again, I was talking with experienced teachers, but when I asked them specifically about mistakes, for some of them, they just said, oh man, I really need, I said, tell me a time that a child made a mistake recently. Just tell me the story of it. It was hard to come up with an answer because so much of teaching is so fast paced, just one thing after the next. And so I do think it's important to make space, especially for teachers to reflect on their own positionality and their own, their own views of mistakes, because those are going to be witnessed by the children and emulated by the children. Thank you. Um, we're probably going to just uh, try to answer one more question. Um, how do you think the different styles of learning to deal with mistakes during kindergarten could impact how students cope with mistakes later on, such as in high school and college? And this question is from Sarah. Thanks, Sarah. I, I do think that uh, Kindergarten, one of the reasons that I love it so much is it really is an introduction to school. It's a welcome to school. So children come there on that first day. Some of them have been in, in daycares or preschools since they were very young. Some of them have been at home, but this is how we usher in. This is how we're starting to have the culture of school be built up. And so I do think that those early learning experiences and the emotions linked with them they do, in my view, have lasting effects. And there are studies, other studies beyond mine, of course, that show that the influence of teachers early in life does have uh, outcomes going on. So I do think, I think that this is a conversation that should be a part of all phases of, of our education. And although many times, I think if you ask teachers, they would directly say, yes, we need mistakes. We need to learn from mistakes. This is important. The little micro level interactions that are happening um, on this day-to-day, -day, on the day-to-day -day basis really tell more um, and elaborate how, how the teachers live those beliefs. Great. I think we're going to try to squeeze one more question in. <laughs> sure. Um, this one is from Nicole. Uh, what do you think we can learn from these kindergarten teachers and students that applies to upper grades? How has this work informed your teaching of college and grad students? This, this work has really influenced me. Um, both, first of all, myself as a learner, which I have to admit, I was definitely more of a perfectionist when I was younger and just want everything to be perfect. 
And I didn't think about mistakes other than you should try to avoid them. Uh, and so when I actually learned about the benefits of mistakes, how it helps you stretch and grow and move into new areas, I realized, wow, this is really, really powerful. And I can feel, I recognize in myself that my emotional response, my physiological response to mistakes is different now. I think that's something that I would like because I think that students, whether they're in kindergarten, in 11th grade, in college, in grad school, we have to make mistakes if we're doing something new. If we're only doing things we already know, okay, we won't make mistakes. But if we wanna push the boundaries, we really need to um, think about this. So in my own teaching with, with um, co at college and university level, I have direct conversations with people about it. And I also try to create a positive environment where I say, we're gonna try out new things. You won't know how to do it. You're gonna be trying stuff out. So you should expect it not to be perfect and try to make an environment where, where feedback is valued, opportunities to try again are valued. Um, so that's my, my little part of the world where I'm trying to uh, make a difference on that front. All right, that's a great note to end on. Thank you so much, Malika and Tina. That was a great conversation. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Malika. Thank you all for coming. I appreciate your presence and your support.